Accidents happen when systems break down and there are few systems as complex and dangerous as saturation diving on a deep sea gas drilling rig. Now, when you go and take a look on the internet to find information about the Bifid Dolphin accident, you're going to come across some horrific images. So please be careful when you start to take a look for this accident and be aware that what you come across is going to shock you. The Bifid Dolphin accident is one example of such a complex system designed to drill 20,000 feet into the Earth's crust. Mount Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa at just over 19,000 feet. So that's like sitting on the highest peak of Africa and drilling all the way down to sea level. And it drills that deep while sitting perfectly stationary in 1,500 feet of deep ocean, sometimes in gale force storms. The Bifid Dolphin, owned by a Norwegian company, Dolphin Drilling, started construction in 1972 and launched in 1974. This was not a small rig. It measured 350 feet by 220 feet by 120 feet deep. Most recreational scuba divers only dive as deep as 100 foot or 30 meters. On the 5th of November 1983, two Norwegian saturation divers, Bjorn Bergesen and Truls Hellevik, were completing their work at around 80 meters or 265 feet deep. That depth is really important because at the surface you have one atmosphere of air pressure. But at 265 feet, these two divers are working in nine atmospheres of pressure. That's nine times as much as at the surface. So they finish their work and make their way to the diving bell, which is going to take them back up to the surface. In order to understand the complexity of saturation diving, you need to know a little bit about how gas affects your body under water pressure. Recreational scuba divers breathe normal air. That air is compressed into a diving tank at high pressure and then you breathe that air from your regulator. The air you breathe is made of oxygen and nitrogen. It's just normal air. Your body uses or burns some of that oxygen. The nitrogen on the other hand starts to get stored up by your body. In fact, about 3% of your body is nitrogen gas. So if you weigh 180 pounds or 80 kilograms, then about 85 ounces or two and a half liters of your body is nitrogen gas. That nitrogen is absorbed into all the different parts of your body tissue, your brain, muscles, blood, heart, liver, joints, bones. When you go diving and you're under greater pressure, your body still has space for 3% nitrogen but the nitrogen gets compressed and so your body absorbs more nitrogen until the volume of nitrogen fills the 3% space. At 265 feet deep with nine times as much pressure, that 3% space gets filled with nine times as much compressed gas. If you go to the surface too quickly, that compressed nitrogen gas will expand back to nine times its size until it's the same size it was at the surface. Technical divers and saturation divers have to do decompression stops on the way back up to the surface, which gives that gas enough time to expand slowly and dissolve back into the air they breathe out. Recreational divers don't stay down too long or too deep. Most dives are above 100 foot or 30 meters and last just over 30 minutes. With those conservative limits, not a lot of nitrogen builds up in your body. And that's because it takes time for your body to absorb the nitrogen. If you don't stay down too long or go too deep, then you can go directly to the surface without serious risk of decompression sickness. For Truls and Bjorn, diving at 265 feet, they have to breathe a special mixture of oxygen, nitrogen and helium called Trimix. That's a small detail worth mentioning, but it's not that important for the sake of this story because nitrogen and helium are stored by the body in exactly the same way. When Bjorn and Truls arrived on the Bifid Dolphin, they spent about one day acclimatizing to the pressure. That's roughly how long it took for the nitrogen and helium to saturate their body. That's where the term saturation diving comes from. The problem for Bjorn and Truls is that being saturated with nitrogen and helium at that depth would take them almost four days to decompress safely. And so the diving bell they're now climbing into is their life support. Instead of spending four days decompressing after working their shift, as saturation divers, they were about to seal the diving bell and lock in the same pressure as the depth they're working, nine atmospheres of pressure. 
And so they close the hatch and tighten the seal. They radio up to the surface and the winch begins to pull them up to the platform on the Bifid Dolphin some 265 feet above them. On the Bifid Dolphin there is another set of pressurized chambers called a habitat. As you can probably guess, the habitat is pressurized to 9 atmospheres. What this means for Bjorn and Truls is that they can live at the same pressure for almost one month and they don't have to go through decompression until the end of their working tour, which is normally about 28 days. By the time they are saturated, they can stay saturated. In fact, when Truls and Bjorn get back to their habitat, they aren't alone. There's two other saturation divers who are asleep in the habitat. British divers Edwin Coward and Roy Lucas. Now, a saturation habitat is not exactly a comfortable place, but there's enough space for each team of divers to have a bunk to sleep, they can cook, and of course there's toilets, and they can sit and play card games and relax. This habitat has three chambers. Each chamber can be sealed on its own, or they can be open for divers to pass between them. This means that one set of divers can be in decompression in their own chamber, while another pair of divers is in the middle of their 28-day working tour. And so the Bifid Dolphin always has a team of divers at the ready. As it happens on the 5th of November 1983, no divers were coming or going, and so all three chambers were open. Each chamber was approximately the size of a camper van. But as we already discussed, when you compress nine atmospheres of pressure into that same space, you have nine times as much air squeezed in there. That's like taking gas the size of a Boeing 747 and squeezing it into a camper van. So now Tools and Bjorn's diving bell gets hoisted onto the deck of the Bifid Dolphin. From there it's brought over to the habitat and then the divers and two tenders on the outside go through a procedure to attach it to the habitat. A tender is a diving chamber specialist who will work on the gas rig to make sure that the habitat is functioning correctly. They regulate the pressure and the mixture of the various gases in the habitat, as well as restocking food and water for the divers. The two tenders are William Crammond and Martin Saunders. When the diving bell docks with the habitat, there is a very strict procedure to work through. You can't just connect them and start opening the hatches because you need to make sure the pressure in each compartment is the same pressure. The habitat also has a tunnel called a trunk. The trunk is a section that a diving bell will attach to. It's also the section that will be open to the ship and so sometimes it's pressurized and sometimes it's not. After docking and clamping the diving bell to the habitat, okay. Martin and William, the two tenders, pressurize the trunk so that the pressure is the same as the diving bell, the trunk and the habitat. Bjorn opens the hatch for the diving bell and crawls through the trunk. He opens the hatch to the habitat and climbs in. Now, Tools climbs out of the diving bell and into the trunk. He turns around and closes the diving bell behind him. Then the two tenders increase the pressure in the diving bell slightly, which will make it easier for the diving bell to disconnect from the trunk. Then Truls turns back to the habitat and crawls through the trunk and into the chamber. What should happen now is for Truls to close the hatch between the chamber and the trunk. Then William and Martin can slowly increase the pressure in the trunk and unclamp the diving bell from the trunk. But what actually happened will be recorded as the most catastrophic, explosive decompression in the history of saturation diving. For some reason, before Truls could close the hatch between the habitat and the trunk, tender William Crammond unlocked the clamp that was attaching the diving bell to the trunk. In the blink of an eye, all the gas that had been compressed into the habitat and all the gas that each of the four divers had absorbed into their bodies instantly and explosively expanded. Decompression that should take four days to complete now took less than a second. The gas in the chamber expanded from the size of a camper van to the size of a Boeing 747. All the gas the divers had absorbed into their bodies, that 85 ounces or 2.5 litres of nitrogen and helium, abruptly expanded to nine times its volume. All that gas from inside the habitat had only one way to go, and that's through the hatch that Truls is about to close. Now, Truls is standing in front of this hatch, and all of a sudden, all this expanding gas rushes through the hatch and takes Truls with it. Truls' body is, in the same instant, both exploding from the inside out and being forced through the hatch that is only partially open. 
His body parts are sprayed all over the deck of the Bifid dolphin. Parts of his spine and intestine were found 30 feet away from the trunk. The diving bell itself is jettisoned like a cannonball, instantly killing William Cramond. Somehow, Martin Saunders survived, but with serious injuries. The other three divers are also instantly killed by the gas expanding rapidly from inside their body tissue. Their blood boils and their body tissue is pulverized from the inside out. The coroners will conclude that though their deaths are horrific, none of the men would have felt anything because they would have been killed instantly. The accident is initially blamed on operator error when William Crammond released the lock holding the diving bell in place and before tools could close the hatch. A lengthy lawsuit and an independent investigation would reveal in 2008, some 26 years later, that the equipment was faulty and there were no fail safes. And so tender William Crammond was exonerated as the sole cause of this incredibly horrific explosive decompression on the Bifid Dolphin.